it is that time. I don't need these headphones anymore because there's no audio. Um, well, welcome back to Reacts. They released a shooting guard episode or or article. We did point guards yesterday, and y'all seem to enjoy that. I saw some of the comments again. You can agree or disagree with what we say around here, but it seems like everybody kept it civil in the comment section. That's all we really care about. So link is in the description to the actual article. It again is Andy Bailey and Dan Favell, and I still don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. So no disrespect if I'm dis if I'm not saying it right. But these are the top 15 shooting guards this season. Forget forget your resume before. This is strictly based on this season. That's the way I always see it when somebody says this season, okay? So let's get into it, man. Number 15, Danny Green, Tim Hardaway Jr., Evan Fournier, Buddy Hield, and Marcus Smart. Shout out to Marcus Smart for making this list. That makes me so happy. Uh, Danny Green. Danny Green is, I mean, one of those players that every NBA team would love to have. He plays his, well, his, his role so well. There's not many people that play their role to the extent that he does, right? He's going to knock down that shot when you give it to him. He's going to play elite level defense. He's going to be one of the best. What is he very good at? Um, getting back on defense on like a fast break. Fast break defense. Danny Green is elite. Why? I don't know. I mean, he may not have a crazy chase downs like LeBron James, but as far as just like preventing another team from scoring where he's the only guy back, great. He's amazing at it. And, of course, um, again, he's older too, so maybe his impact maybe not as good as it was last year or the year before that. Overall, though, Danny Green's just such, such a good player. And that's why he continues to get these contracts. Tim Hardaway Jr., man. I always see Tim Hardaway Jr. as like a flamethrower uh, type of player. Where, like, when he's on, he's on and he's looking great. And I guess I'm thinking about a, micro a microwave, right? And when he's off, sometimes he can look really, really off. But more than not, this season, he's been on, right? He has been on. The 2019-2020 season may be the best of Tim Hardaway's career. He's supposed to career highs and threes. Per possession, three point percentage, true shooting percentage, and win shares. And if you're hitting all of that in a single season, you're looking good. Um, the Dallas Mavericks have been plus 12.7 points per 100 possession, a 98th percentile when Hardaway is on the floor with Luca, and a plus five when Luca's on the floor without Hardaway. So there's there's the big difference, right? You know, a big difference between 12.7 and just a five. Tim Hardaway and Luca has a nice nice connection when they're on the court together. Actually, on my podcast, we actually talked about that today, which is very weird that it's coming up. Evan Fournier. Uh, Evan Fournier is one of those players that may get overlooked because he plays in Orlando and overall Orlando's like a good but mediocre team at the same time. But this year he has been very, very good. Um, he isn't just a catch and shoot option either. He's done plenty of damage off the dribble. Shea, Chris Middleton, Kemba, James Lillard are the only players in the lead who match or exceeded his field goal attempts and effective field goal percentage on pull-up attempts this season. Legendary. See, I didn't know that. I mean, that's a great company to be in with Kemba. These are all-star players other than like Shea, but these are all-star players and he's in that same conversation on that one statistic that is also a very important statistic for a wing player. Buddy Hill. We know Buddy Hill is good at that thing, you know? Prior to his season, Steph Curry four times and Steve Novak, the only player in history with a season that matched Buddy Hill's three-pointers. Y'all already know that. Then Marcus Smart. Again, bro. Oh, Zach Levine at 10. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But um, Marcus Smart. I mean, if I'm picking a guard player to build my team around defensively, I have to pick I have to pick Marcus Smart, bro. I have to. As far as impact goes, the man is ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? He is ridiculous on the defensive side of the ball. So I'll take that at 11. Number 10, Zach Levine. Um, I would have to see who's above him. But I think I usually put him around 8-ish. Uh, personally, because I get to watch him every single night, and I know the type of burden he has with playing with the Chicago Bulls. I know a lot of people don't like him because he is like, hey, I'm going to give me points, and people see that as empty stats. But one thing I can say about Zach Levine, he's never been in a situation where his team should be good. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I hope that the Bulls eventually get good enough with Zach Levine or that we trade him to a situation where he can be seen differently. Because I, I hate the idea of empty stats like Monte Ellis got it a bunch um just players like that that yes i'm great at scoring the ball but i've never been on teams that are really good so my stats stats are considered empty to the general public when i know that if zach levine was not on the bulls we are the worst team in the league i honestly believe that without zach levine we are the worst team in the league that's how much of an offensive impact he's had and over the course of the the years he's been in chicago his defense is getting better his playmaking is getting better his decision making is getting better have to remember he's still a young nba player but him being at ten, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fuss about. I'm not gonna fuss about. Um, depends on who's above him, and that's. Yeah, I'm not gonna fuss. I'm not gonna fuss. CJ McCullough, man. 
You're not going to fuss about CJ being over Damian Lillard at this point of their respective careers. I would hope that eventually when Zach Levine is CJ's age, he might be higher than nine. But uh, CJ deserves a lot of credit is what they're saying when viewing his game through a lens of uh, conventional stardom. CJ is probably never going to make an all-star game and he'll probably always be second fiddle to Damian Lillard. But he's like one of the best second fiddles you can have in the NBA. Um, so I agree with CJ being at this point as well. Next, Donovan Mitchell at eight. Wow, that fe that feels low. That feels low, but I have to see who's above him, especially when you think about Donovan Mitchell. Uh, again, we're only testing off this season. Keep that in mind. With the, the offensive burden that he has a lot, on, you know, especially with Mike Conley coming in and not being the Mike Conley that we hoped, and I hope that Mike Conley was great. I am a Mike Conley fan. I, I don't have many, like, you know those jersey shirts where it's like a shirt, but it also got the name on the back. I have a Mike Conley one. I have three. I have three of my entire collection, and one of them is Mike Conley when he's with the Grizzlies. So, like, I really love Mike Conley. So, when I saw him ended up in Utah, I was like, yes, let's go. And he just didn't end up that way. So, Mike Conley being bad, um, Donovan Mitchell was like, okay, I got to do more than what I did last year. And luckily, they have Bogdanovich and Joe Ingles to come in and help as well. But, uh, okay, I can agree with him at, at around eight. Shea is seven. <sighs> Woo! Hey, if you're, again, if you're a fan of the chatter, you know that Shea is my guy. He is my guy. But seven. Over Dono? Over Zach? Seven? Oh, uh, hey. I believe he will be there. Seven. I mean, it does, it does... That's actually very interesting. It is okay. I can see, again, this. I don't say I agree with it, but I can see you putting him over Zach Levine, over C.J. McCollum, putting him over Donovan Mitchell is what's really curious to me, because I mean the knock on Zach Levine, of course, the team can't win. But Donovan Mitchell's team has always been in the playoffs as far as he's been in his career. And Shea's on a playoff team as well, but you get what I'm saying. And I think Donovan Mitchell holds way more of an offensive burden than what Shea does, considering Shea has the best closer in the NBA on this team this season. And uh, everything like that. But it is... Okay. I mean, let me see. All the tricks Shea gives Alexander Flash as a rookie have proved to be a prelude. First of all, I must say, I was very early on the Shea Gilgis train. I saw him play his first game of Summer League. And I was like, that's going to be my guy. I'm, I'm going to just say that. I'm going to say that right now. Um, he's no longer a young prospect ahead of the schedule. He's one of the NBA's most underrated scorers. Shea Gilgis Alexander has made great use of his... Of the extra license, OKC Thunder is blah, 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 the 10%. Blah, blah, blah. It's very weird to see him. Uh, his all-star peak isn't yet in play. It feels inevitable. I do think he will make some all-star games this career. It's very weird to have him over a guy that was literally an all-star this year. You know what I'm saying? I don't get it, but I can check the web for That just scared the absolute... Whoo, my soul jumped out of my body. Next. Six, Jalen Brown. I like Jalen Brown at this point, man. Jalen Brown acquired a lot of the doubters when he got that paycheck this offseason. They like, Max contract with Jalen Brown. He ain't really accomplished anything on the offensive side of the ball. We knew his defense was good. And then this year, he's like, I'm going to average a dub. I'm going to average a dub. I'm going to shoot it very efficiently. Um, 38% from three is very good. And then 55% on his twos. I cannot complain about Jay Brown because he is a two-way player. And I'm saying if I'm picking a young up-and-coming guy, and I still consider him up-and-coming even though he's been in the league for, what, four years now? Um, he is also on the short list of young players that I, I would want to build a team around just because of his two-way ability. Um, still feels weird that he doesn't have his flat top anymore. Next, D-Book. D-Book at five. This is probably the highest I've seen him um, because Devin Booker's another guy similar to like Zach Levine where people saw his numbers as empty So I'm happy that he's getting some respect as the fifth best shooting guard in the league right here Some of y'all may say that he deserves to be higher, but I think five is a good spot We know him to be one of the best offensive players in the NBA um, His team's front office just hasn't been able to really build a team around him to be successful But they're headed to the bubble man anything can happen in the bubble Four, Drew Holiday is really high and again, I agree um, he's damn good and underappreciated. I'd probably put D-Book above him, at least by one, personally, personally. Um, and I know Drew Holiday has closed out a few games this season, but, again, the offensive burden maybe not as high as it is here. And in reality, their teams are kind of close in the standings anyway. I understand Drew Holiday being a two-way player. I mean, he can guard three and a half positions and stuff. Um, before, seems a seems a bit a bit high, and I love me some Drew Holiday. Um, actually, Drew Holiday is the second out of those three shirts that I have. It's Mike Conley, Drew Holiday, and, and D-Rose. 
know what I'm saying? And D Rose. Uh, Bradley Beal at three. Bradley Beal's averaging 30 points per game this season. He's been incredible. Um, people were saying that once John Wall comes back, he won't average great numbers. But, like, come on, bro. Bradley Beal is a bucket. He's turned into the star of that team. I don't care. Like, John Wall's great. Don't get me wrong. And I don't know if he'll be great once he comes back. But Bradley Beal is a star of that team is what I'm saying. Three, Bradley Beal. Two, Paul George. All right. Um, is there a more plug-and-play plug superstar than Paul George? I would say that for some reason, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, this feels like a down year for Paul George. Maybe because last year he was an MVP candidate, and that's kind of what I expected this year. It's an unrealistic expectation. I know he's been good this season, but for in my brain, it feels like a down year. Um, but overall, um, great player, great player. The number one y'all know is going to be James Harden. Who, who else could it be at the best shooting guard in the NBA? All right. I mean, I don't hate this list. There are some things that I don't agree with, but that's that's the best thing about being a fan of, of sports is that you can disagree respectfully and just have a dialogue. All right, leave a like if you enjoy. I'll be back. Peace.